So when we're talking about this idea of fruitfulness, we want to ask ourselves, where did this idea begin? And as with so many of our core beliefs, it begins in Genesis 1. Because Genesis 1 and 2 is our glimpse of what God intended before sin came to, to distort and to change what God wanted to see. And so it's so uh, helpful to us in so many areas to go back and say, what did it look like when God had everything the way he wanted before sin came? And this is the first time that we see this idea of fruitfulness. Of course, God said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. And so we want to go back and, and look at this and try to understand more. What was God thinking? What did God intend when he said that? So just as a review for us, God created all of the, the natural world, the heavens and uh, the plants and the animals and all that. And then his crowning creation, he created uh, men and women. And he said, let us make man in our image. And so he created Adam and he breathed his own life into Adam. And what was the first thing he did? He gave Adam a job. And he said, Adam, I want you to name all those animals. And we don't know how long it took, but just imagine what Adam had to do to fulfill that responsibility. He had to look at each creature and he had to think, what, how do I capture that creature? What word can I use? What name can I create that will be the appropriate name for that animal? And God didn't give him a list to choose from. It wasn't a multiple choice. And we also see that God didn't change his mind. He didn't say, Hippopotamus, are you kidding? <laughs> We're not going to use that one. That's a dumb name. Okay, you want to call it a hippopotamus? We'll call it a hippopotamus. And, and so we see God gave Adam a responsibility, and he gave him the authority to carry it out. God didn't take it back. God didn't change his mind. He expected Adam to think, to create, to take that responsibility, and God honored his decisions. Now, God created this beautiful garden, and it says every tree was there, and it was beautiful to look at, and it was productive. It was fruitful. It was, there were things that were good to eat on those trees. And when God put Adam and Eve into the garden, he said, now I want you to take care of this garden. I want you to increase it. I want you to steward it. And steward something means it belongs to someone else and it's your job to take good care of it. And so we see God saying, here, here's the garden. Now it's your turn. Make it better. And so the garden was productive. It had everything Adam and Eve needed. Take good care of it. Now, do you think that God had in his mind, oh, a few generations from now you're going to run out of food and your descendants, they're going to starve? Well, of course not. God's intention was this garden is fruitful. There's plenty for everyone. Make it better. Make it more fruitful, more productive. God doesn't intend for little kids to starve. He didn't intend for our world to not have the produce and the productivity that would bless all of the descendants of Adam. They were also beautiful. And God values and delights in the beauty of creation. And so part of their stewardship and their care to increase the beauty. And so God is saying to Adam, I want you to value beauty. I want you to be creative like me. I want you to delight in it and increase it. Now the next thing, we want to look at is the relationships in the garden. Now, Adam was by himself in that first job when he named the animals. And God let him do that in order to discover he had a need. He needed a partner. He was lonely. He didn't need a slave to carry things for him. He needed a friend and a companion to share life with him. And scripture says that God made Eve as his helper. Now, if you are in trouble and you need help, you don't go to someone who's weaker or more ignorant than you are 
you go to someone who knows something or can do something, you can't. And so we see Adam and Eve, they needed each other. They were partners. And God gave them the responsibility of the garden together. He gave them the authority to change, to steward, to increase together. They had the same capacity, the same responsibilities. Now, when sin came and began to break and distort what God had intended, they each had a different set of consequences as man and woman. But God never took away their shared responsibility and their shared authority. And we see the description of their relationship before sin. That they were naked, but they were without shame. And so God designed relationships to be open and honest with no shame, no control, not one dominating over another. So when we look at Genesis 1 and 2, we see this wonderful picture. This is what God intended. And now we can work together with God to begin to restore His intentions. So if this is what God is doing, and this is what God wants, then what is the role of education? Education should be producing students who can be those kinds of people. Now when God said at the end of creation, now you be fruitful and you multiply, what was he talking about? He was saying, I want you to be fruitful and multiply people with these kinds of relationships and these kinds of abilities. I want you to be fruitful and multiply people who can do and be what I have just led you to do and to be. I want you to be fruitful and multiply people who can take responsibility, who can take initiative, who can think carefully and create new solutions. People who can increase productivity and blessing and provision. People who will value and delight in and create beauty. I want you to be fruitful and multiply people who have relationships that are based on equality and respect and no shame. That was his mandate to them. Not just making more babies, more people with two legs. They had just finished discovering all that God had designed them to be and to do. And then he said, be fruitful and multiply those kinds of people. And so now that is our responsibility in education. We have a part to play to create young people that will have those same capacities, carry those same character qualities. And so we have to ask ourselves about the fruit in our classrooms. We have to ask ourselves about the practices in our classrooms. Are we developing young people who can think and create, who can problem solve, who can take initiative, take responsibility? Are we building classrooms where the relationships are based on respect and equality and partnership, where there's no shame, there's no control? This is what God intended when he talked about being fruitfulness, being fruitful. And so these are the kinds of things that we need to consider as our responsibility as educators. Now that's a more of an in-depth look at that first mention of fruitfulness. And it's an important one for us to begin our thinking. But we are more familiar perhaps with the New Testament. And we've already looked at what did Jesus have to add? What did Paul have to add to this idea of fruitfulness? Because we see it does go all the way through the scriptures. And so the New Testament concepts have to do with bearing the fruit of the Spirit, the character of Jesus. It has to do with having an impact, fruit that remains on society, on the lives around us, bringing others into the kingdom of God. And we have a wonderful passage that where Jesus taught us how do you bear this fruit? It's by abiding. It's by intimacy with God. It's by drawing on the power of the Holy Spirit so that our lives are transformed, so that we are these Genesis 1 people, so that our lives bear fruit that remains. We have an impact on those around us to glorify God. Now, God commands us to be fruitful 
And that means that we can be. That means that every person, no matter their design, no matter what area of gifting, no matter their capacity, no matter their nationality or tribe, every person can be fruitful. God wouldn't ask us to do something that we couldn't do. That would be unfair and unloving and unwise and unjust, and God is none of those things. So when he says to be fruitful, it means every person can. That means every person can stand before God and hear him say, well done. And yet we're not all designed the same. Some of us are designed to be excellent, work with our hands, we're carpenters or we're painters. Some of us are designed to be teachers. Some of us are designed to play soccer. Some of us are designed to work in the government. We have different giftings, different capacities, but all of us can live in a way that glorifies God, that brings blessing to the communities around us. This is what it means to be fruitful from Genesis through the New Testament. And these are the things that we need to start asking ourselves. What does that mean to me as an educator? What should education look like if we are to raise young people who can take their place in being fruitful and glorifying God on the earth? The earth. So how do we become fruitful? Fruit grows on trees and every part is necessary if we're going to see abundant, rich, sweet fruit. So what are the parts of the tree that contribute to the growth of fruit and how does this relate to education? Well, any tree has to start with soil. And, and it matters what the soil is like. You can have rough, dry, arid soil or you can have soil that's rich in nutrients. And when we're talking about education, the soil is what is true about God? What is true even if we don't understand it? Even if what we believe is a little bit distorted? What are the things that are inherently true about God? This is what is in the soil. These are the things that don't change. And the question that we ask ourselves is, what is real? What is real about God and who He is? Now, the next part on a tree is the roots. And roots are what anchor the tree into the soil and begin to bring the nutrients up through the tree out into the fruit. And, and the roots for us are, what do we believe? And, and there's hundreds, if not thousands, of things that we believe. And sometimes we're believing uh, accurately what it is that's true about God. Sometimes we get it a little wrong. But there's lots and lots of implications, lots of things that we believe. And so our roots, we have to ask ourselves, what do I believe? And so our question there is, what is true? And one part of the tree is the trunk. And we've got two big trunks here. And the trunk provides strength and structure and support. It's the conduit that brings the nutrients up from the soil through the roots and then on into the tree. And so the question that we ask ourselves to identify uh, our trunk is what is valuable to us? What do we value? What do we consider good? Then we go out into the branches. And this lovely old tree with lots of branches. And, and branches are what um, we consider the principles. What are the principles that we live by? And, and maybe there's one trunk, maybe two, but there's lots and lots of branches. There's lots of possible principles that we can uh, determine that we're going to live by and make our decisions by. Because the branches, the question is, what are the principles? And the branches are what make room for lots and lots of fruit. And so the end, the purpose of a tree is to bear fruit. It isn't to grow branches or have a nice trunk. The purpose of a tree is to grow fruit, lots of fruit. And so the fruit in our thinking uh, model here is the end result 
our actions or our decisions. And if we're going to, our end goal is fruit that nourishes, fruit that brings change, fruit that glorifies God. We're looking for actions that are wise. There's many scriptures that talk about the wisdom uh, and the fruit of wisdom. And so our goal and our question when we're determining what fruit, what actions should I take, is we ask ourselves the question, what is wise? So let's go back and look at the, how the whole tree works together. How does this whole system work? We're going to start again with the soil. Okay? So I want you to make these motions with me. Okay? It's going to help make this teaching very concrete to you. So we're going to start with the soil. Okay? So the soil down here, this is what is real. What is our worldview? What is real about God? Okay, so that's our soil. We pull the nutrients, the life in the soil, up through our roots. Okay, so up through our roots. So, so do this with me. Here's our soil. We pull it up through the roots. Now, the question here is, what do we believe? Okay, what is true? Then we come up to our trunk. And the trunk are our values. And the question here is, what is good? Then, now do this with me go out into the branches. And the branches, our question for ourselves is, what is, the branches are principles, and our question is, what's the right thing to do? That's what we ask. What's the principle? What, what's the right thing to do? How does that guide my, we get to the fruit, the decisions, the actions that we're going to take? And the question here is, what is wise? So let's do it again, okay? Come down. Here's the soil. Our question is, what is real? What is our worldview? What is real about God? Those are the nutrients we pull up through the roots. We pull up through our beliefs. The question is, what is true? We bring it up into our trunk, which is our values. And our question is, what is good? And we come up into the principles. The principles, we ask ourselves, what is right? because what we want is the fruit. And the fruit brings the question, what is wise? What would be the wise actions that would bear the kind of fruit that we see God wants for us to bear? So we can ask ourselves the question, uh, what if? We can start it. What, what if this is what's in the soil? What if this is what's true about God? How, how would that shape my beliefs? What if I believe that? How would that shape my values and what I consider to be good? What if? What if that's what I value? What if that's good? Then what would be the principles that would be right? If what if those principles are right, how would that guide my actions and my decisions? So we go from the soil to the roots to the trunk to the branches to determine what our action should be. But the other way we can use this model of thinking to arrive at biblical fruit that's rooted in the reality of who God is, is we can begin by examining what are some of the decisions and actions and choices that I've made? What are some of my practices in the classroom? What are some of the things I do? Do those come out of what's true about God? So the question we would ask ourselves is why? If, if these are my actions, why? Why do I do that? What principle am I operating out of? Is it, is it right? What are my values behind those actions? Are those really what is good? What are my beliefs behind those actions? Are, do those reflect what is true? And what am I presuming is true and real about God as it's expressed in those actions? And so we can start from the soil and come up. What is true about God, therefore I will make these choices and decisions. We can also start with some of our current choices and decisions and ask ourselves, do these really come from the biblical soil? What is really true about God? And so whether we're going to go up from the soil out to the fruit or from the fruit down into the soil, 
we can ask ourselves those two sets of questions to measure our lives and to align, bring our lives into agreement with what we know is true about God. Because just like a tree, if this tree were struck by lightning and it broke one of the branches off, there wouldn't be any fruit on that branch. And so any time that we break off, that our, we're not living in alignment, where we're not pulling up what's real and true and valuable, any time those things aren't in agreement with who God is, then we're not going to bear healthy, vibrant, life-giving fruit. So we want to use this model in our lives, in our families, and in our classrooms to evaluate. Are my practices, are my attitudes, is the way I speak to the children, does that line up and flow from who God is? So we'll be working with this model again and again throughout the training so that it helps us begin to think more and more biblically. So the fruit of our actions, our lives, and what happens in our classrooms bears more and more godly, biblical fruit that changes the lives of students and their families, communities, and even nations. So how did we become so focused on success? How did this become the model that we almost all have agreed to and live by? I've been to lots of countries and talked with many educators and with our global media. There's uh, evidence from all over the world that we all share a very similar value system of success in a worldly sense is our goal. How did this get started? Where did this come from? Many years ago, before Jesus even walked on the earth, there was a very powerful culture called the ancient Greek culture. And they were a small nation to begin with up in Europe in the um, Greek peninsula. And they were well known for their the beauty of their culture. They were thinkers, they were artists, they wrote plays, they made beautiful sculptures of the human body. They, they were thinkers. They loved to debate. They loved to discuss ideas. And they had a mindset that there was no absolute truth. Truth was defined by mankind. They saw man as the measure of all things. What we decide is right, it's right. What we decide is true, it's true. We as human beings are the measure of all beauty. And so they developed a culture where they would meet and they would discuss and they would debate and whoever was the most powerful communicator, his truth won the most influence, changed the most minds, and then was true. And they had a system where there were a very few people that ruled over the rest of the culture. And these people had to be uh, ethnic Greeks, they, they had to be uh, pure-blooded Greeks, and they had to be landowners, and they had to be men. And so the idea of democracy, where the people get to vote and decide who their leaders are, this began in ancient Greece, but it didn't include everyone who lived in the country. It only included men who owned land and were pure Greek. So they had this belief that those few people were qualified to rule. They were all, of course, wealthy. And so they were the ones who were qualified to lead, and therefore they needed special knowledge. Special knowledge was what was needed and what qualified them. So they had an education system that was built on only the boys go to school, only the boys of wealthy landowning families go to school. And when they go to school, the only thing that they need to learn, they need to learn to debate well, they need to learn how to persuade others with their ideas. 
so they must be trained in logic and public speaking skills. They uh, should be men that appreciate beauty and culture, so they should learn about the arts. But all these young men need is knowledge, because if they are to lead, they're never going to get their hands dirty. They're not expected to do anything practical with what they know. What makes them the elite, what qualifies them to rule over us, is they have knowledge. Not skill. They don't use their knowledge to build things and do things and serve others. They just need that knowledge because the knowledge alone will qualify them. And so the system of education to support this was based on everybody can go to lower levels of school. Not, not everybody in the country, but all little boys could, that were Greek and their dad's own land, they could go to the lower levels of education but the higher you get in education, the fewer people can come. So, don't we see this in our world today? Uh, there's wide agreement that most children, if not all children, should have a basic level of education. We call this primary. But often, you have to qualify in order to go further. You have to take a test to see if you have knowledge. And if you score high enough and you have the best score and the most knowledge, then you get to go on to the next level of education. Then it gets very intense and very competitive. And you have to score the very, very top to prove that you have the special knowledge. Very few people get to go into university. And then at the very, very top, we have those that go on to post-university studies, graduate studies, PhD. And we see those people with the most knowledge as they are the ones who are qualified to rule. And so our whole system of education is built on Greek values and a Greek model. This isn't biblical. Greek people weren't Christian. Greek people had pagan beliefs in a pagan God. And so the system that we have all come into agreement with does not have biblical roots. It was a very powerful culture, wonderful gifts that it gave the rest of the world. And their ideas and their values and their practices spread all over the world. Their great military leader, Alexander the Great, was very thoughtful about this. Every place his army went, he brought families right afterward, and he built towns that looked just like the Greek cities back home. He established Greek institutions, everything. He passed Greek culture and Greek language all over Asia, all over Europe, all over North Africa. And today, the legacy continues. Almost all of us think Greek. Almost all of us have grown up in a system like this, and we've been in agreement. And so if, and it makes sense, because if the purpose of life, the way the world defines it, is to be successful, to make the most money, to have the most power, to be the most well-known, very few can reach that. And we have come into agreement with this system that what qualifies you to be one of those leaders is special knowledge, and only a few. And so our system of education excludes. Our system of education only rewards the few that get the top grades and have the most knowledge. So this is the explanation of why we do what we do. And if we think about our biblical roots, we realize this doesn't line up with what we see and what we hear from God in his word. Now let's use our belief tree as a way to understand how what we know about the Greek culture has become the educational practice that we have all been a part of. So if we go to our belief tree model here, what is in the soil? What did they perceive anyway was real about God? Nothing. 
there, there was no truth. There was no absolute truth. There was no absolute reality. It's just whatever mankind happened to think and communicate at that time. And man defined truth. That was one of the, what they thought was in the soil was, well, whatever we think it is. So if we look at their roots, what they believe, what were they pulling up? They were pulling up that um, if we look at their roots and what they believe, they believe that only the wealthy, only the landowners, okay, only the wealthy can rule or define truth. Okay? So only the wealthy rule or define truth. That's what they believed. So therefore, what would they value? Okay, what would be in the trunk? Therefore, they are going to value, they value lots of things, wealth and prestige and all that. But for our discussion about education, they valued communication skills. If your ability to communicate is what determines how you lead and how you define truth, communication skills are very important. What they did not value was working with your hands making any kind of practical application. This is where we get the belief and the value that, oh, I'm too important to work with my hands. I don't want to be a farmer. I want to work with my mind. That's what's important. That's where the status is. I don't want to clean. I don't want to pick up garbage. I don't want to work with the soil. I don't want to be a carpenter. Oh, I'd rather work with my head. And so we value that in education. Oh, everybody should be a lawyer. Everybody should be a doctor. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. My child wants to be a farmer. This is from a Greek pagan belief system. So they value communication skills, not practical or hands-on skills. Therefore, what would their principles be? Let's look at the principles. The principles would be that let's look at the principles. Their principles would be that only a few, the branches, only a few need to be educated. Not everybody needs education. Only a few. Only the elite. Only those who are qualified to lead. And another principle was knowledge is enough. You don't need practical skills. It's enough just to know things that other people don't. So those would be the principles that determine their actions. What were some of the actions about Greek education? Some of the specific actions were only boys went to school. Okay? Another one would be only landowners' children went to school. Only the wealthy went to school. Okay? Fruit that would come out of this branch or this principle of you only need knowledge is the actual subjects that they studied in school. They studied logic, they studied debate, they studied the arts, and they studied, uh, they did a lot of physical activity so that they would have beautiful human bodies. Because you remember that they valued uh, and they saw man as a measure of all things, including what was beautiful. That's why all their statutes are of human bodies. And so we see that they just, even the subjects that they taught, they learned astronomy, they learned mathematics, not so they could balance the city's budget, but just so they understood and they had knowledge. It was just to uh, give their brains some exercise. They weren't expected to do anything practical with it. That's why they had slaves. That's why they had battles, so they could conquer people and make them do all the work all the practical work, because Greek people were above that. So we can see that their culture and their beliefs have powerfully shaped our view and our practice of education. Now, let's ask ourselves, what did God intend, and what does that mean for our education system? Now, let's contrast that with God and His ways. We begin our human story with Adam and Eve, 
but they quickly became the Hebrew nation, the Israelites. And God taught them about every area of life. When they followed his ways, they were blessed and they prospered. And when they didn't, things did not go well. And they didn't follow God in every area of life. And so if you study how the Hebrew people lived, their education system wasn't exactly in alignment with what God taught them. But let's look at how God intended their education system to uh, what he intended it to be based upon and what kind of fruit he intended it to bear. Now, the most important element in bearing fruit is what's in the soil. If you have dry, barren soil that's been stripped of all its nutrients, you can have a beautiful tree there, but it's not going to bear fruit. Because the soil, the nutrients in the soil, is what pulls up through the tree, up through the trunk, up through the branches, and out into the fruit. And so we're going to look at what is true about God. What is in the soil of a biblical world belief? The first thing that we know is true about God is He is both infinite and He is personal. And that combination is unique. Christianity is the only belief system that has a true representation of who God is. He is infinite. He is the uncreated. He is before and after time as we know it. He was the one that spoke and all of matter as we know it came into existence. So he is the uncreated one. He is the infinite one. He is the infinite God. And yet, he's also Emmanuel. He's also personal. He gave us that. He designed us for relationship because he had relationship. He is personal. He thinks, he chooses, he loves, he creates. He is personal. He makes choices. And he has relationship amongst himself with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's out of that great love and relationship that they shared that they created Adam and Eve. And so we have this combination of reality about who God is, his nature, his being, his character. There are other religions that believe in an infinite God who's also impersonal, great force out there. We also have God, religious beliefs that say, oh, he's very finite. He exists right here, right now in the natural world, and he's very personal. In fact, he's a rock. In fact, he's a tree. Christianity says, no, he is the infinite, uncreated God, and yet he's very intimate, very personal, very present with us. Now, how do we know if our beliefs are lining up with the things that are real about God? So, quick soil check, quick way to check your soil. If we recognize we have a belief that makes God seem more distant, unapproachable, that's, that's not a biblical belief. If we have a belief that makes God seem so small and controllable, that's not a biblical belief. Anything that makes magnifies the majesty and the awesomeness of God and increases our intimacy and relationship with Him, those things are likely true. Now, there's another element that's in the soil. So one is, God is infinite and God is personal. Another element in the soil is man. We are finite and we are personal. Now, this may come as a terrible surprise to some of us. We are finite. We need to sleep. We need to eat. We need to take care of our bodies because we are not infinite and eternal. God created us in his image with many of his same capacities for relationship. He made us personal. He gave mankind the ability to make choices, 
to choose to love or to choose not to love. He gave us the capacity to remember, to evaluate, to, um, to laugh. He's given us so many of his same qualities, the qualities that are needed to have relationship. We don't have, the, we're not made of the same stuff. We're finite, where he's infinite. But we have been given those shared qualities so that we could have relationship with him. So God is infinite, and yet he's personal. Man is finite. That's where we're different. But we are also designed with the capacity to be personal. Now, there's more in the soil. We're going to talk about some other qualities that God has designed into mankind. And that is, we make choices. We make choices, and those choices have real consequences. And we see this in the very beginning with Adam and Eve. The first thing God did is he said, Adam, you choose. What do you want to name those animals? He gave Adam a real ability to choose. We're not puppets. God isn't secretly controlling us behind the scenes. He said, you choose. I give you the biggest choice we will ever make. I give you the right to accept the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross to reconcile us to God, to be restored, to live in loving relationship under his lordship and partnership with him, or we can reject it. We have that choice. And those consequences will be with us for eternity. And so that's the ultimate choice. But we have many choices along the way. When is the last time God forced you to be good? When is the last time God held you back and wouldn't let you be evil? We have real choices to make and real consequences for our actions. And so if we're going to use the soil check about the way that God has designed man, anything that devalues a human being, that's probably not a biblical belief. Anything that brings us a sense of hopelessness, fatalism, passivity, well, there's nothing we can do. We can't change that. Oh well, must be what God wants. Okay. No, no. We have been given the capacity to co-create with God, to make choices, to use our minds, to be creative, to make choices that have consequences. These are the earmarks of biblical beliefs. Now, the last area that is in the soil that is so important has to do with the nature of truth. And we know from the way God has designed reality and what he reveals in his word that truth is absolute. It does not change. And truth is knowable. God has revealed himself and his ways to us in large degree. He's given us a mind to understand and to reason, to ask questions, to gain more understanding. And these things are called into question in today's culture. Truth is what I want it to be. If I don't like your truth, it doesn't apply to me. Whatever I feel is what's true. If I feel like I love you, I do. If I feel like I want to be involved immorally with you, then it must be right because I feel it. No, that's not true. The truth is God designed one man, one woman for marriage and we're not to have physical relationships with people outside of marriage, however we feel. How we feel doesn't change what is true. We may feel like God has abandoned me. That's not true. We feel it, but that doesn't make it true. And so this is so important in our world today, where so much of our cultures define truth by our emotions, define truth by what we understand or what seems right to us, what we want it to be. 
And we see in Scripture and in the very nature and character of God that truth is absolute and truth is knowable. He is a God who has revealed himself to us. He is a God who has worked together with the minds of mankind over the centuries to reveal how he's designed the universe. We understand some of the laws of nature, some of the laws of reality God has built into his creation. And when we work together with him, we find wonderful solutions for, for sickness, for poverty. Uh, we are able to innovate and create as we discover the truths about God and his ways. So these four elements about God, about man, and about truth, these four things are in the soil. And sometimes what we believe comes, pulls all of this right up out of the soil. Sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes our beliefs are quite in agreement with biblical truth. We're always growing and learning. And culture gets it wrong. Every culture has some facet, some part of it, that has wonderful revelation and agreement with truths about God and his ways. And every culture has some distortion. And so the things that seem right and true, beliefs and values and principles, we can't take it for granted that just because we've always thought that was true, we have to be willing to go back and ask ourselves, does this really come from a worldview that is rooted in the reality of who God is? So this soil is what's very, very important to having a biblical view of the world and for us as educators, a biblical view of education. So these things are in the soil. What are in the roots? What are some of the things that we believe if we are to have a biblical view? Well, we believe that God has given us truth in all areas of life. God hasn't just told us how to behave in church. God has given us truth about how to manage our families, how to run a business, how to set up a government, how to create beauty in the arts, how to provide health care for a family and for a community. God has given us truth in all areas of life. Okay, so we can write this in here. These are one of our core beliefs is that through God's Word and as we listen to His Holy Spirit for fresh application, God has given us truth for all areas of life. We believe that. We also believe that God intended, when He told Adam and Eve to be fruitful, he intended that fruitfulness to go on through the generations. He intended Adam and Eve and all of us as their descendants to increase the beauty and the productivity of the earth. And we believe that. And we are confident. God intended there to be enough. God never intended for starvation. God never intended the environment to be wrecked and devastated. God never intended for people to live in filth and poverty. This, we don't see this in God's intentions. And so we believe that God commanded them to be fruitful, and he gave us everything we need to be fruitful. And so we believe this. We believe this from what we know is true about God. Therefore, what is good? What is in the trunk? What do we value? What do we consider good? Well, we consider the value of each person. Each person has been created by God. So each individual has great value. We don't distinguish between boys and girls. We don't distinguish in value between tribes. We don't distinguish between those with whole bodies and those who have some aspect of their physical being that isn't fully healthy. We don't distinguish between those who are smart and those who don't have that same capacity in their thinking. Each person has been created by God and has value. 
So we value the individual. We value God. We value relationship with God. Relationship with God, growing in our understanding of Him and His ways, connecting with Him through worship and prayer and studying His Word, responding to Him in faith and obedience. We value this. God has made all of this possible. We see that in the soil. We believe it. And therefore, we see that is good. I want to live my life so that is one of my highest and it is the highest value. So we value relationship with God. We value individuals. And we value the earth. We value what God has given us to care for. There are many other things that we value, but for the sake of our discussion about education, we're highlighting these areas. We value taking care of the earth. We value uh, being able to increase its productivity and its beauty. So we value the earth. We don't worship it, the way some religions do, but we don't destroy it. We don't destroy its beauty. We don't destroy its productivity. In the natural world, the earth itself has value because God gave it to us to care for. It. Now we ask ourselves, what are the principles that are going to come out of our beliefs and our values, what are the principles? We ask ourselves, what is right? What is going to guide our actions, especially in education? And so we ask ourselves, what are the principles? One of the principles is learning should prepare us to be creative, to solve problems. Uh, another principle would be that the classroom community, classroom environment, should be one that values individuals, where relationships and individuals are honored, where there's equality, where there's, um, there's not injustice in our relationships in the classroom. So learning should be creative and solve problems, and the classroom community should value relationships and value individuals. So we should have a principle of equality and respect in our classrooms. This is the kind of environment that we want to have, the principles that will guide us if we do value individuals. So what are some of the specific actions and decisions that we would make in the way that we run our classrooms. If this is what is real about God, these are the things that we believe, the things that we value, the principles that are right, then what are wise actions for us to take in classroom practice? Practically, if we compare it with the Greek system, only a few should be educated. Our worldview our fruit would be everyone should be educated. Everyone has the capacity to hear from God, to create with God, to solve problems, to glorify God, to bless their communities. Everyone should be educated so that they can discover the truth that is knowable. They can be educated to have relationships and to solve problems. So one of our very practical things would be everyone is educated not just the wealthy. We would also have as a specific action that in our classrooms we make decisions so that everyone shares responsibility. We don't just have the little girls doing all the classroom cleanup. We don't just have the boys taking all the leadership roles. We have classroom practices that are going to demonstrate everyone has a place, everyone has respect and value. We're going to create a classroom environment where we're not just giving the answers, but we're teaching children how to think, how to create. These are some of the very practical questions that we are going to ask ourselves through this course. How do we create classroom environment, classroom practices that come right out of who God is, what we believe, what we value, what we know is right? 
to bring the biblical fruit that is going to make it possible for every student to glorify God in all that they do, to bless themselves and their families, their communities, and their nations in a way that glorifies God and brings the earth to love and worship Him. So let's give ourselves a very short, very simple conclusion. What is biblical education? We've seen that biblical education is based on what is true about God and who He is. The purpose of education is to prepare every student to be able to glorify God however He has designed them, to give them the knowledge and the skills and the character to glorify God in their own unique way, to fulfill His design for them. Why? So that the fruit of their lives brings blessing. The fruit of their lives blesses and nurtures their families, their communities, their nations, in order to glorify God on the earth. So that's a very, perhaps a simple summary of what we've been looking at. What are God's purposes in education? Giving ourselves a new framework as we think about what does it mean to be biblical educators, what kinds of practices do we want to develop in our classrooms so that we are pulling from biblical reality up into biblical beliefs, into biblical values, biblical principles, so that we end up with the kind of fruit that we see in God's Word with the effect to glorify God in the nations.